Okay, so um, for the panel, everyone is going very short kind of work talk about what you do and your work, and, and then we're going to get into a deeper discussion. And I don't want this to be one of those panels where you watch us talk and then we have a Q&A. Like, um, this is a small enough and manageable group that we can consider it a dialogue from the outset. Okay, so let's just start with the far right and Hassan. Okay. Good morning, how's everybody doing? Right. My name is Hassan Davis. I am currently serving as Commissioner of Juvenile Justice for the state of Kentucky. I have operational, administrative, and fiscal responsibility for more than 30 youth facilities. Uh, we serve, probably have about 2,000 kids in our secure setting out through our community, probation and parole, and uh, it's, it's a real challenge. Outside of that, I'm a lawyer by training, but more importantly, I'm an artist, an arts activist. I've been cut my teeth as an artist in residence, uh, as a writer and an actor uh, for years, and then wound up in this work because I realized that there was a need uh, not just to, to figure out how to engage young people, but maybe you know further upstream how to get them to a point where we can engage them. So I've been working in juvenile justice on the state and national level uh, for about the last 10 years, uh, I guess 15 if I'll be honest. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm excited to be here uh, for a number of reasons. I think the work this morning was incredible and, and uh, you know, Brother Yusuf and, and his story and the, the continual challenges of how we, we work through this system. I've got two brothers serving life sentences. I've buried five cousins. I grew up in the gang culture of Atlanta, Georgia, St. Louis, Missouri, and, um, and, and making such a dramatic shift uh, was in itself a challenge, but the arts is that piece that really grounded me. Some of you may know Alice Lovelace, at least by name, if not by reputation, and that's my mama, and that's my lifeline. And so mm -hmm. the art really was that thing uh, at a pivotal moment in my life that gave me the choice to be something other than what I was clearly intended to be. And so I'm glad to be here and, and appreciate the opportunity to be with these great folks. Uh, I'm Buzz Alexander, and I'm um, uh, the, the founder of the Prison Creative Arts Project, which is now in its, uh, we're, we're in the, our 23rd year uh, now, it'll be 24 uh, in January. Uh, we've done a, a number of things. We have the, um, we're about to complete our 600th uh, play uh, <laughs> here in, in Michigan. Not all the plays are good, uh, but some of them are absolutely great. Um, and we have um, something like uh, 240 uh, poetry writing workshops that we've done in the prisons, uh, youth facilities, and Detroit high schools. Uh, we have uh, done, I think, about 155 uh, uh, art workshops uh, in the prisons, uh, youth facilities, and, and a few of them in, in the high schools. Uh, we have the largest um, prison art exhibition uh, in the world. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, 252 artists here in Michigan uh, submitting work last year. We had 370, 397 uh, pieces of art uh, in this show. We also work with incarcerated uh, youth, uh, enabling them to uh, uh, create portfolios, either of their art or of, of their writing. And we've worked with, I think, almost uh, 200 of them now doing that kind of work. And we also have a linkage uh, project where uh, when people have, have come home from prison, um, and have extreme, extreme amount of uh, challenges, uh, we're able to support them as people who've learned how to, to, to who've, who've cared about writing, uh, doing art, and uh, uh, theater inside of uh, the prisons. The basic uh, thing that I'd, I'd like to say about what we do uh, is that we celebrate the resistance and the power of the men and women and the youth inside of the prisons. We understand uh, isolation and numbness and so on, but what we recognize uh, and support is the fact that these people are stepping up, uh, being creators, uh, uh, figuring out how to work together as families and communities, and that's what we help make happen, and, that, and it's what they make happen. You know, I'm uh, Yusuf Bunch Shakur. 
I am the chair of an organization called Hope, Helping Our Prisoners Elevate, which was started uh, maybe a year before I came home. And Hope it was founded by some comrades of mine that was incarcerated, as well as community folks. And, and what Hope Mission was, we felt if we can change the thought process of prisoners, we would give them a real, a real chance. And that was based upon the, 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 the examples that we all lived on. Uh, we began to send books in the prisons. Uh, unfortunately, in the state of Michigan, we ran into a lot of roadblocks, <laughs> sending books into prisons and, and <laughs> helping them you know, uh, be, be friends and, and, and engaging themselves. So we also started... Tell, tell us what those bro... I bet people don't know how difficult it is to send a book to prison, uh, yes. even as they're emptying out and closing prison libraries. Yeah, I mean, it makes it so hard in the sense of where you got to be a proven vendor, all, all this crap. And then, and a proven vendor is a proven vendor is a bookstore or, or someone that's licensed to, to Amazon, Amazon, Amazon things that name, you know, so or, or <laughs> it's coming straight from the publisher. And then, as we all know, anybody familiar with prison life is at the discretion of each prison. Each, yeah. one, you go to one prison, everything goes. You go to another prison, <laughs> everything that you bring with you, you got to send home. You like what the hell? <laughs> so, uh, so what we began to do was started sponsoring free bus trips for family members because also we saw that as a need where you had guys that like going 10, 20 years without seeing their loved ones, family members. So again, you know, trying trying to tackle a lot a lot of those issues within the, uh, within the last couple of years I've also become a member of an organization called All of Us and None, which is a national organization coming out of uh, the Bay Area. And uh, All of Us and None is the one that put on a map uh, the band the box that, that folks have been there doing that across the country. I'm, I'm familiar with that band of boxes that have you ever been convicted of a felony. Uh, we initiated here in Detroit where we had it passed on the city level where it's no longer on their, on their uh, application as well as among the, uh, the vendors. So and also we just worked with Congress, Congressman Hanson Clark to, to get it on the con on, 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 uh, congressman, I mean national level through, through his office. So, he was recently. He wasn't reelected. He wasn't reelected. So because of redistricting. Exactly. Redistricting. So we're trying to um, possibly, you know, still, still um, you know, pushing forward. The band, this band of box, not only in Detroit, Kalamazoo, and I know out on the Bay Area and other places, it, it has it has taken a, an impact. You know, so you know, again, and what the whole thing is, with like, you know, with Michelle Alexander, book where she she's been introduced to conversation of New Jim Crow. And for many of us who, who understand the, the Jim Crow, you know, realize like the folks are still being discriminated against, permanently being discriminated, openly being discriminated against. You know, so how we talk, how can we say we progress in society when when folks who are the real criminals are continuing to get free passes, when everyday folks who, who make mistakes can't continue to get no opportunities. So again, you know, when we look at it as far as on a human level, when guys coming out of prison. And we want we expect them to succeed when, when there's no real opportunities out there. Now I love I love Michelle I, Michelle as I book, but you know from an academia standpoint it helps. But as far as the actual lives of individuals coming home, there that part of that conversation I challenge you all to really get into. You know, and when getting into, into that is getting to the lives of those of the family members of those individuals that has to live live that. I mean just just think if you go on 20 years and you come back to your neighborhood. <laughs> how how much has changed? Now you got to relearn the bus route. You know you got to relearn your, your family. You got to relearn you. I mean, just those dynamics there is a motherfucker. It's what, hard. And that's uh, that's a lot about what one of Yusuf's books is about. Um, I, ha I I remember picking someone up um, from prison who just done 15 years, and on the way back I stopped at a gas station and I was like, you're the guy. You pump the gas. I, I didn't realize that he would be stuck at the gas pump for five minutes, not realizing all that had changed in the 15 years that he'd been locked away, um, down to even putting your credit card in. To, I mean, you know, we don't even think about these things. We're just out here in the streets. Okay, so we, um, I, I guess I want to start with you, Buzz. I mean, you've talked about the work that you're doing, but Michael Fess is trying to answer, you know, some kind of specific questions. And, and this could be anecdotal, but I'm wondering what does the work actually look like? I mean, you could tell us about a particular, like, student or prisoner that you worked with, but what does this look like to go into these spaces and, and do this work, which is art? 
like whether it's your t the poetry, wh whatever, whichever you like to share. But yeah, well, basically, and I'll try to try to say this fairly quickly. But uh, when we go in as students at the University of Michigan, um, we take risks and we're as vulnerable as the people inside of our workshops. We're able to uh, connect with our liaison, we're able to get things focused, but after that we are as vulnerable as anybody else in, in doing the work, and, and for us that's, that's very, very important. Um, the, uh, I guess the other piece of that is, is that uh, we, we act in the plays, uh, we write poetry, when you say you act, you mean you perform? We, per we perform <laughs> together with them. Uh, the, the plays are all original. Right. Uh, our 600th play will also be original. Right. Uh, and um, I think that's incredibly important, is, is that we're, we're part of that. We act, we write poetry, we, we get up and perform with, with the, uh, the prisoners, with the youth, uh, with the high school students we work with uh, here in, in Detroit. Um, and I guess that's the, that's the key thing. Uh, one other factor is that uh, uh, that's really important for us is, is that we b believe in who's in the room. Whatever the space is, uh, we, we build a kind of trust. But the main thing is, is that uh, no matter what people are doing in that particular space, and they're very challenging spaces, they're very hard spaces, uh, people are disruptive and so on, is that we believe that we're going to work it out, and we believe in the people who are in the room, no matter who they are, uh, because they're going to step up and make it happen. And that's for, for us. That's that's the key thing that we do. How, how do you? And I and I understand that as a philosophy. How do you communicate that belief? Like, how do you? Yeah, create the, the space for. I'm assuming people who, oftentimes, have never either acted or written poetry and. So, so how do you communicate or facilitate that? Uh, right at the start, we, um, when we go in to do a theater workshop, for instance, uh, we are wacky, uh, we're crazy, we, we run around, uh, uh, and, and, they get, and, and they get it. Uh, they understand that that's uh, what, we're, what we're there for. Uh, uh, and, um, and that's the same, we begin a poetry workshop, same kind of thing. We have fun exercises, uh, people step up. Uh, and they get it very, very quickly. So we, we communicate it through, through what we do. We don't come in and uh, say, here's what you need to do. We don't uh, come in with lesson plans. We don't come in with, with ideas and everything. We just uh, illustrate what we're doing and they catch on very, very quickly. Um, Hassan, does anyone have any other questions for Buzz right now about how he's doing the work that he's doing. Yeah, sure. Can you go a little deeper into the anatomy of a project, specifically a performance project? Like, walk me through one project of, like, the awesome. thing you did first, sort of, and just the arc of it, because I think it's pretty amazing, but to, the, the more nuts and bolts, I get sort of coming in being wacky. But I'll, I'll, you took one yeah. project and walked us from beginning sure. to... I think sure. I'll tell project. you about one play, which is uh, the best play I've ever been in. It was in the women's facility. Uh, and we were kind of figuring out what we were going to do. And at one point, somebody said, we have to talk. And it's related to what we just saw. Uh, somebody said, we have to talk about forgiveness. And uh, it got- or one of you guys? Huh? Uh, they said that. They said that. They said that. Um, and, and then forgiveness became very, people were hugging each other. They were crying. It became very, very emotional and powerful because of people were telling their own particular stories. And we all told our, our stories, all of us that were involved. Um, there was one person who had um, uh, killed her husband. Um, and she talked about, uh, at the end of her story, she talked about having done it with her own hands. And it's a longer story uh, to talk about what happened there. But uh, it became a very powerful play because it was about being able to forgive, or not being able to forgive, which turned out to be true in some cases, uh, or being able to forgive yourself. Uh, and at the end of the play, um, uh, somebody came up to me and said, this will change the yard. 
I don't think it changed the art, but but uh, but basically, it was about um, when we opened the the curtain, everybody was crying. It was very very emotional because of what we in fact done in that play. It's the best play I've ever been involved in. So that was the process. It was gradual. We had to explore it. We had to think about it. We had to figure out which scenes we were going to do. It ended up with some dancing uh, going on in the play. Uh, three very powerful people as the, working as dancers and so on. Um, so that was that's basically the process. It was gradual. We had to think it out. We had to figure out which scenes. Um, we invented it. We moved with it. Uh, we eventually got it down to a final performance. Um, <coughs> Hassan, I, you talked about. I mean, obviously, you're you're on the you're the man. <laughs> you know, the first time somebody said that, it pissed me off so bad. I was like, ah, I am that guy. I've been fighting for my whole life. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering what you're doing to connect, you know, um, well, one of the questions is connecting people to place, but also how you're connecting your beliefs to the job that you have to do and this belief that art can be transformative and can possibly, I, I, I imagine you hope that it will help prevent recidivism yeah. and, and, and just create real rehabilitation. Oh, right. When I, and it's, it's a challenge. I think that for me, I, I walked into the system sideways, and so kind of, you know, I, I was there, and people didn't know what I was bringing with me till I got in the door and unpacked, and they were like, "Oh crap, he's the man." And um, and and the first thing that I did was I called the arts council and I said, you know, we need to get artists in these places, and that's a long drawn out process. Uh, but actually, just last week, I had three of my uh, two teachers and, and two facility superintendents go to an arts an artist training for the arts council to train artists and to talk to them about the challenges and the issues that we face in the facility and what what we need artists to be able to do in order to come to those systems because for me there's a big disconnect you know as a, as an artist and you know my whole family's artists you know my father was a reggae singer, my mom's a poet and a player, you know, my sister, every, everybody. And so I grew up with that sense as a background, but then you come into facilities and, and you don't wear lots of brightly colored clothes and walk around and frilly dress, you know, all that yeah. stuff that we kind of take for granted when we gather. Are things that you know, and you know, when artists come into schools, with you know, my sister has dreads, and she's got bells, and you know, everything, and so she rattles. And it's like, but you know, <laughs> you just, and but you can't do that in in these facilities, right? Everything's a risk. Everything's a a balance. And so for us, the conversation is, you know, we have to have you here, but we have to figure out how to to make you able to infiltrate this system. You know, like me. You know, I you know, I I I wear a suit now. Right. I hate it, but I do it every day because it's what gets me into those conversations where I can go, and by the way, next week I got some people coming to see you and you need to let them in, right? Yeah. But, but letting artists understand that you know who we are and all that creative stuff can be expressed and taught in a way that doesn't sit off every alarm or every conservative person who wants to command and control. Because that is, until we get to a better system, that's what folks think this is, right? This is command and control. And so for me, it's about setting the stage so that I don't have to fight all the people who have been doing this 20 years and there's no way in hell no hippies going to come in here and talk about, you know, hugging people, you know, because, you know, that, those are the things, right? You know, we want to, that's a good job, baby, you did good, it's, you know, cry some. And these people, my people, who I'm trying to change, but they don't like it, you know, are losing their mind because you're getting too close and you might pull one of those bells off or one of those beats might be used next week or something. And so a, a big part of it for me is, is being gradual. You know, not, not coming in saying, okay, we're going to do a show next week and everybody's going to have to share something. Uh, you know, but saying there's an expectation, and it's not even about the art first. What I said first is we have to start doing family engagement, because if a child doesn't have a lifeline outside of here, then they don't have nothing to go back to. And we have to start doing things like speaking to them like human beings, and we have to start, you know, we have to start understanding trauma. I was talking to these folks, you know, trauma, before you get to all the other stuff, you know, that's the, that's the thread. You know, 90 percent at least of the folks that come through our system and wind up in the adult system have experienced at least one serious, dramatic, traumatic 
experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if at the core of whatever we do, we understand that because the art is the healing piece. It's the thing that allows us to take that trauma, to identify it, and then to figure out a coping mechanism. But if we don't actually identify that piece of it first, then we, we don't actually understand the conversation we're having. You know, we start opening people up with theater exercise and expressing emotion, and you just left, you just took the pin out of a grenade. But, but for us, and so for my systems, I've been having this conversation about trauma, because it is the single thread that runs through all of these systems. And if we can understand trauma and actually start to engage a young person, not just when they're locked up, but when they're in the school, when they're in social services, when they're in the court, if everybody looking at a child instead of saying, what did you do wrong, and you know, saying, you know, what did we do wrong, you know, where did we miss the ball, then it gives us some space. And so the first piece is I'm trying to get a trauma-informed system. I'm trying to get my folks to understand that hurt people hurt people. But there's another piece of that, right? Touched people touch people. Right? And so if we can understand that there's pain there, but we have the ability to mitigate that pain by bringing in the arts, bringing in family, bringing in all those other systems to, as a, as a band-aid. You know, these are the things that we use to, to start to rebuild. And so it, it's crazy because I'm probably the only one in this position in the whole country. We just had a gathering of all the directors of heads of, of juvenile corrections and, you know, most of these guys have no idea. Most of these guys don't want any of us anywhere near their system because it messes up a very simple process. Sit down, shut up, do what I told you to do. And what we're saying is it can't be that simple. Can, can you tell me a bit about this training manual that you've created for artists who are coming in? Well, it's a, well it's, it, right now it's just a conversation. I've, I've got some, we, we, I, was, I was telling Buzz, we've, Shakespeare Behind Bars, which I know has a component up here. The other, other city that it's working in is Louisville, Kentucky. And, and the person who runs that project out of Louisville also comes into my juvenile facility and works in tandem with a group of young people working through a Shakespeare piece every year, too. And so it's really, I really started to build through Shakespeare Behind Bars. We do a mural project with uh, Emmanuel Martinez who comes in and he does these great murals and works with processes with young people in the detention centers. And then we have a couple of other things, you know, greenhouse poets come in and do some poetry work. But they're spread out. And so what I've done is I've gathered the superintendents and the teachers who work and bring those artists in and have built a relationship. And I'm using them to teach one other folks in our system that, you know, you can have these things happen without losing control. Right. But at the same time, they're going out and talking to artists. The, the training we did with the artists uh, on, the, on the state arts roster is, you know, these are the things that work with high-risk communities, and especially youth that come in our systems, these are the things you have to be aware of. These are, you know, as you, as you start to do your artistic process, just understand. It doesn't mean you have to stop, but you may need to understand that you may elicit responses differently. Right, because you may trigger some things, or you may have an encounter that you have to process with the counselor because that might have some real significant impact on what happens later on. And so it's just a, a part of understanding place, right. you know. And it's just what we, what we do when we go into schools for residencies or when we have festivals. But the place is very different than most of us traditionally go into. And it's just being able to internalize that. And you know, we've had artists that. Go in one time and that door locks behind them. They say, "Oh no, I, I, mm -mm, no, that, you that know, occurs art, to me with art don't work here, yeah. right?" And so yeah. you have to kind of prepare yourself for that and and understand that it's it's going to be different, but but the the possibility and the impact of it is is, is phenomenal. And so for I mean, for me that it's worth it. It's worth it to to push it and to really really try to make it happen because when it does happen well, and I think Buzz speaks to this incredibly well, you know, it, it has an impact that, that is, is way beyond the, the scope of that small group that you start with. And I want to get back to that about the evidence of that impact, but what you just said, I mean, if you see me looking at my phones, it's because I have notes here, it's not because I have a boyfriend texting. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, you, what you doing? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm just sitting on a panel. Um, <laughs> I wonder how many people, even as, as Hassan was talking, are willing to kind of modify their own practices to go into a place like, I mean, you know, if that's, yeah, I mean, because you come from a training, yeah. you know, you come from theater training, sometimes very advanced, you have your MFAs and 
Yeah. I, I would, okay, I'm going to say something very controversial, but Wait, I would be it. very suspicious of someone who modifies their work. And what I mean by that, I'm following by that by saying is that people are people are people. I understand that you have to do modifications based on place, but when I was at Wandsworth, which is the largest maximum security prison in, in England and in, uh, in Europe last summer, um, I just walked in and, I, and, and what was successful about the workshop was I treated them like people. You know, and we had a conversation about poetry and we had a conversation about writing and we had a conversation about what's on your mind. And that's what I do with anyone. I do that in a college class, I do that at a regional theater, I do that, you know, whatever. And so I'm I'm concerned. Well, let me be this. Clear. And I do what understand. I was saying. So, so I, again, I'm, that's not so. No, 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 I, I know. I was responding right. to what she was saying. Okay. I was responding okay. to, to yeah. the yeah. question, to the well, prompt. No, I, just to be provocative, because okay. obviously modification, I mean we all modify to some extent, right. but 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 I, I just want to say as a as a practicing <laughs> artist, like it's you walk in with your art, you walk in with your heart open, you know, and, and you do that with every room and you assess every room, but to say, I'm going to, you know, act in a particular way with young people or I'm going to act in a particular way, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, I'd like I, I to... I didn't mean the way you act or even the yeah. content, it, it, but, but go ahead, yeah. It, no, well, it's more about, like, if you start with, you know, if you start with a certain kind of exercise that works for you in most circumstances, I think, um, uh, I, I work with Cornerstone Theatre Company, and a few years ago we did a project called uh, For All Time that was um, where we, st one of the things that we wanted to do was to, um, we, were, we, were, we were talking around the, who is the community that we would work with around ideas of um, punishment and retribution in terms of justice. And, um, and yeah, we talked to a lot of people who were formerly incarcerated, we talked with people who we, we had partnerships with organizations that do um, like reentry programs um, and um, uh, lots of different people, victims of violent crime, their families, people who are interested in restorative justice, all these things. But a big missing component was people who are currently incarcerated. So we, we found a way to um, do a workshop in uh, a California Women's Institution, California CIW. Institution for Women, and is that right? Um, and uh, in Chino, and we did workshops. But the workshops, like when you start to go in, the the rules were really new to us. Like the things that you have to watch out for in terms of power dynamics and how people people might. We were told that some people might not want to make decisions. Like you can't give them a lot of options right away because they're not used to having a lot of options. So kind of easing to, into things like that? Now that I wouldn't agree. Now that I probably fall on the side of Daniel, but I meant in a real pragmatic way in terms of what Hassan was saying. Like, even Buzz's example of like ending in a hug session, like, I never, our, our hugs are timed when I go to prison. 20 seconds, you know, and they break it up. I'm sure you know that, Yusuf. If you get 20 seconds, is damn near like sex, right? Like, and like, <laughs> get these five second hugs and, right. and you're not so I didn't mean necessarily the content or or but the like I probably would reject that notion that oh they haven't had a lot of choices so let's not get them a lot even if I'm sure someone said that to you. I'm sure but I, I, I meant I'm, more about I'm probably re reducing it greatly but there were certain things that came up in terms of um, awareness. Not don't do these things but you should be aware that these are things that you might run into along the way. And so I think part of the, our practice was to, we did the, a lot of the things that we do, but also we're, one of the things we do is respond to who's in the room and where they're at at the time. And so m we maybe didn't, we made choices about what we started with and maybe re-examined where we push at the beginning and, you know, push boundaries with people. So I think that there's some modification, but it's just, it's what we do is to is to respond to people. So, but I think as artists we do that in any room. Exactly. I think exactly. what I was trying to say is that you don't make a special accommodation for a, a particular group that as 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 hopefully as as conscious, aware, you know, artists we 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 scan any room 
and exactly. make assessments based on that room. I mean, I've worked with professional, I've worked with Broadway actors who will not make choices on their own because they've come from a tradition of the director telling them what to do. So, you know, I mean, that, I mean, but so then in working with, with that group of people, there's a, there's a, a gentle nurturing process of letting them know that this is going to be safe and I'm not going to, you know, scream at them for them making the choice, you know, the wrong, the quote unquote wrong choice. So I guess what I was just saying is I, I sometimes hear people talk about this work yeah, in, ex, in, in quotation marks. You know, and I hear a lot of them, and I hear you know that kind of conversation. So I, maybe I misread no, your right. question, but I but what 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 prompted me to speak was this notion of hopefully as artists we are not making accommodations, not not having a fixed way of work that then we deviate from, you know, for this particular population, but that actually we walk in, and I'm sure most people in this room this is not new news, but that we walk in flexible, we walk in open, we walk in thoughtful. We walk in considering people's circumstances, and then whatever workshop we're doing, we're doing all of that at the same time as you know bringing our our, our tried and true techniques and whatever. So that that's just what I wanted to respond to. I uh, I'm not doing it real practical. I have, yeah. I have someone who went to a women's prison and wants to begin how she begins all of her exercises with some yoga poses, and the prison was like no yoga. Um, you know, so just real, I mean, and, and this is, I guess, one of the overarching things, like what are we learning about work and working and when and where and what and how it relates to place and how we modify it. Uh, I'm, I'm really eager to hear a lot more from you. I'm about you, to go you, to you, so, yeah. Uh, but then I'd also like to uh, have uh, Sari talk about what she's doing. She's sitting down a little bit lower than us, but uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, and she, I think she wants to open it up uh, to more discussion. Sure. Um, do you want to do that? Well, Yusuf, I want to talk to you about, well, there, for, for everyone, I want to know, like, what's the evidence that you said that this can be transformative, and what's the evidence that this is work, that this is working? But since we're in your place right now, um, Yusuf, and not only in your place physically, like in this wonderful <coughs> bookstore and, and community space that you've opened up to us today, but also in your place as in your, we're in your hood. Um, I want to know, like, how you are able to to know that your work is working, like the evidence. Like, how how do you know that what you're trying, and, and when do you know that it's not working, and what are the evidence of renewal or revitalization? I mean, for me, the evidence is is you know the eleven and a half years I've been home, and that's based upon you know coming out of prison. The reputation was. Zone A Jojo. That's what people knew me as. So, you know, coming home at Yusef Shakur, my greatest enemy was myself. That that reputation. So, I mean, it was like motherfuckers had bets, like dude be back <laughs> this six months a year, etc. So which each step I've taken has allowed folks to see like dude, serious. I wrote a book. We do an annual back to school supply at my mom's house. We open a bookstore. So people have been part of the journey. Have you know when folks see me on, on news, you know, particularly like well, that nigga's supposed to be dead. He's on Fox 2 with Hugh Perkins, talking intelligent. Right. You know, he's traveling the country. He just left with Steve Harvey, and but not in a very fictitious way, but in a way like, that's my home. Boy. That's me. That's the guy that, that's coming back to Zone 8. So that evidence is in that, where, where, where they connect to it, but in the sense of where I, I am them. I carry, I carry the weight of who they are every day of my life. You know, when my homeboy just died, who did 20 years serving a life sentence for leukemia, who's fighting every day to get out. You know, I, I carry that with me in, in the sense of, you know, this is this is not about you, such of course, it's about the, the two million that's still in there, whether black or white. Because everybody that want to separate me and put me on a pedestal, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the exception. Because there's guys in this just as smart as me or not smart, just not given an opportunity. But also going into a youth home facility this past week in you know, Pontiac, and talking to these, you know, these young folks, and you seeing the hope in their eyes, man, man I can make it. You know, I can overcome, you know, having an alcoholic brother, not having a father in my life, coming out of gang, a gang culture. You know, when you've been told, you know, for me numerous times at 20, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be see 40. And I see, I'm gonna see 40 next year. But again, in a very realistic terms, in a very realistic way, knowing the struggles are still there, though. The temptations are still there. But what do, what do you do internally? You know, because at the end of the day, like my brother's my son talking about, we don't, we're not healing ourselves. You know, that pain, that hurt, that's causing us to go out to do the things that we only realize that we're doing. 
You know, I see not seeing a beautiful woman, but seeing a bitch based upon because I'm mad at my mama. I'm mad at my sister that has 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 uh, configured me to not to see a woman in because because of, of that pain. So once that pain heals, I may not have no money in my pocket, but I have a rich spirit. I may not have a lot of money based upon the mind of probably who I am as a human being. What kind of things have happened on the stage that we're sitting on right now? Like, and and who was in the audience when those things were happening? Uh, Last year, you know, we, we, this 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 stage here would have only been a year, and we um, opened it up with, with celebrating Black August. We had uh, Willie Tate, Sunday Otta, who, who was a comrade of George Jackson, who was actually there at the time when, when George Jackson was murdered. Uh, we had a conversation with him. We do a, a weekly poetry series. Uh, we had Carl Taylor, who, who's who's a phenomenal um, guy here in the state of Michigan that, that's world renowned for doing game work. And, um, and we, and we have numerous folks that come through, and that, again, you know, you ask, you know, what a youth social court means is based upon those relationships that I've been able to have that's coming to my neighborhood. Tell us what it literally, I, I imagine that your middle name, Bunchy, you're yeah. taking from Bunchy Carter, yeah, the absolutely. infamous um, L.A. Crip who became a very important Panther, um, one of the first people to join the L.A. Um, Panthers. Mm -hmm. um, but, and... I, I'm guessing it's Shakur, but tell us what how you chose your name, and because you were JoJo right. from Zone A, killer, <laughs> like, no, not killer really, but problem solver. Um, you had a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I chose my name uh, Yusef. If you're not familiar, with, it's Joseph, just pronounced in different ways. So I kept that name in honor of my mother, who named it, and honor of my grandfather. Bunchy is in um, honor of our Prentice Bunchy Carter. Who was, a, who was a member, not the Crips, but the uh, Slauson, the Slauson Gangs. That was, that was before the Crips. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, and the Slauson Gangs became the Crips? Why do I think Yeah, that? yeah, the okay. Slauson Gangs was like the, the, the parents of the other Crips. Okay. And, you know, looking at Bunchy, you know, my, I, I relived his life. You know, guy who went to prison, changed his life. So here, because again, we all have models. So I looked at this person as a model. And then Shakur is in honor of the Shakurs out of the the style of Matulu, but also the name it means itself, thankful to God. So the whole name is Honorable Soldier, thankful to God. So as I changed my name, it was a change of my, my behavior. So every day someone would call me Yusef, it was reinforcing, you got to be committed to this change. Like, I mean, one of the most craziest thing, my homeboy had came to prison, I hadn't seen him in a long time, so he's like, what's up, Jojo, what's up? I'm like, man, that ain't my name no more, my name Yusef. What you mean, nigga, that ain't your name no more? Like, that ain't my name no more. My name you sell. And I had to do that for myself. To to because again, there's a lot of guys that go into prison, going you phone, I'm gonna change, I'm a God, Jesus, Allah, whatever. <laughs> Give me one more opportunity, I ain't gonna do this no more. But again, but if you're not if you haven't made that commitment to yourself, within yourself, that God within you, none of that don't mean a goddamn thing. And that was the beauty of the relationship that me and my father had developed. You know, where I became a Muslim and I stopped being a Muslim. You know, he didn't he didn't box me in like you gotta be this way. You know, he was my friend. He was my brother, he was my father, but we dialogued, we disagreed on those things. But out of that, allowed me to grow to be who I am. And, and that commitment has, has been based upon that name. And every time I hear that name, it reminds me of the work that I have to do. This, this is kind of out of left field, but it occurs to me that in our community, and by our community I mean the African American community, you, um, that it's very common to find the name change. Um, particularly post 60s so um, out of whether you're talking about famous people like you know um, Malcolm X just changing his last name or someone like Joanne Chesmar going to um, Asada Shakur um, Yusuf's examples is a common one as we were coming here we talked about um, neighborhoods names being changed um, and that being both problematic um, we talked about Midtown, right? We, it used to be called Cass Corridor. Um, Wani's from New Orleans, but I, I went to Cass Tech, which is in Cass Corridor. And it, the kind of crime that was known, it was very, it's, it was a drug den. It was, um, it's a homeless, the kind of the place where homeless people in Detroit were and gathered and continue to. And so that's kind of more the connotation. Um, do you have a problem, like since you yourself you changed your name to signal this this new beginning and this this new affirmation. Do you have a problem 
with neighborhoods' names being changed? Because you still refer, we refer to this as Zone 8 mm -hmm. in the same way that a lot of words in hip hop are repurposed. Like you're saying Zone 8 as if it's a positive thing, right. but a lot of us in the city still know Zone 8 to be murderers. And, right. Right. So, can you talk to me about naming a place and, and the possibility for transformation in naming? Um, I'll, I'll put it in a larger context when we talk about community. And it has to it has to be a fabric, a fabric of what the community is. But if you're coming in as settlers from a colonial type of situation, then it loses it loses its meaning. You know, so you so when you look at Midtown, you look at Court Town, you know, Midtown and its relationship to Jason to my neighborhood, you would think it would, it would have a great connection. There's, there is no. I mean, you know, growing up, I didn't see Wayne State as an opportunity. So as, so as Wayne State evolved to this miraculous place that it is now. It's a fun, I mean, actually, you are driving through there yesterday, it feels like the suburbs. I mean, they should have, really, they should be petitioned to be their own city, because they got their own police. There, there's no connection to the community. So in that terms of changing the name, it, it loses its value to the community of other people. So when you talk about like Zone 8, the original name for this community was called Northwest, Northwest Goldberg. However, as we grew up, we didn't know that. So again, we took our own name. So like if you say some folks know what's going over, they oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Because it it just never happened in our, in our part of our conversation. But if, if but if it comes from the fabric of that community, same like in prison, and if, if it comes out of that human being, out of that experience, like what Buzz and them does, and giving the ownership to to the prisoner, now they're growing with it. They now they see themselves a part of it versus again something seller, something being enforced, and then you realize it's only benefiting. What, we, what we're talking about now, 1%, which has always been part of American culture. And that's what the names ha has and what it means. So even like when you such a court, it's, it's, it's involved in my communities. You know, JoJo, all that's part of, part of my community. So they're growing with this, and they're seeing the transformation from this person to this person. And it's helping transform the, their lives, because they're seeing, I could change from this person, that person as well, but m making them a part of it. So that's the important for me. Does anyone else have any ideas on that concept of renaming either yourself or places as a way of signaling? I was just really thinking about it. I want to go back to, yeah. I think, I think it just, because a lot of my work is around media communications, like it really resonates with me because it has a lot to do with who is actually the creator of that framing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like in renaming districts, <coughs> renaming neighborhoods, like who's the audience for that, for that, for that future neighborhood, right? And it's, it tends to be not the folks who are there on the ground level. And I think the difference is like in the renaming of yourself, like there's a lot of thoughtfulness and a lot of, I mean, it's a very personal change and a very personal transformation. So ultimately to me, it's like in those communications practices, like who is, who is part of the creative process, and, and that that having a, a major impact on who ultimately gets to benefit. Yeah. Yeah, names tend to signal all kinds of things. I mean, if I say Williamsburg, very specific things come to mind. Um, when I say Detroit, very specific things come to mind. You know. Um, I'd like to talk to you about, and this is for everyone. Um, how do you know that your work is, is, is working? Like, the work that you're doing with these communities? I'd, I'd like to um, turn it over to Sari for a moment, yes. uh, because uh, she's uh, actually the coordinator of our uh, art exhibition okay. every year, and let her talk a little bit about what she does. Where, where's Sari? Yeah. Um, so, just briefly ab about the exhibition that Buzz has mentioned. Um, the exhibition takes about, what, like eight months in planning and organizing. Um, we visit every prison in the state of Michigan. We drive there, physically go in. Um, if we're able to meet the men and the women, we do talk to them about their process, um, about what it's like to make art <coughs> inside. Um, what the work means to them. Um, and then there's this really beautiful thing that happens where uh, as people that go in and select the work, there's this moment where we leave holding their artwork and they watch us leave. And um, 
it's very powerful and feeling like their work is not coming to freedom but crossing crossing into this other world that they don't have access to but that their voices and their visions and their stories um, are able to be placed back into the world and be seen as beautiful and be engaged with um, in the community and for to start kind of talking about this idea of, of impact um, you know there's of course all the anecdotal the letters that come in the testimonies from people um, saying that the ability to create and share that is literally saving their lives um, people on the verge of suicide people that have attempted suicide people um, who are in mental health units um, saying this is what gives me hope and this is what keeps me getting up every morning and living another day um, and so so there's that we know that from from our work but there are also the little things um, for me over the years it's things like hearing people laugh and smile inside of a prison that like that very deep essence of what it means to be a human being and what it means to have a heart um, and to have have that kind of an emotional display with such dignity and with such courage in a place that is with everything in its being trying to do the opposite of that um, and so I, I I think the impact of the work comes out in everyday human interaction um, when people smile when people hear themselves be called by their first name instead of a last name or a number um, that sense of that sense of I am someone and I'm worth something um, and I don't always have to be known for that worst moment in my life um, so in my experience that's where the impact starts to kind of seep out do they what happens to the artwork is there a response back to the creators of the art based on I don't know I don't know what happens with the arts I don't know what question to ask but do they hear back like my I loved how you sort of said part of them sort of transfers over and gets out yeah um, like and so <laughs> what did they hear back about their children their creative children that have left yeah. so there are a number of things that happen um, for starters the exhibition is open to the public and the work is all for sale if the artist chooses the work to be for sale um, and the proceeds from the sale of that artwork goes directly back to the artist so um, we often hear that the money is being used to purchase more art supplies to continue to make art or it's being used for things like a new toothbrush or a bar of soap or you know what I mean or like money to buy envelopes to be able to write home the stuff that the state doesn't just give you to be able to live um, and so the work is for sale um, and we have a guest book in the gallery that anyone that comes to visit can write in, can write personal messages to specific artists. And at the end of the exhibition, we type up every page of that guest book, and every artist that was in the show, whether their work sold or not, is given a copy of that guest book. So they can read all the comments from the public. Um, and we've heard from people that, like, they put it inside their pillowcase and they sleep on it at night. Mm -hmm. um, this packet of the words from people that they will probably never know and never meet in their life. Um, praising them for being something other than what society sees them as. Um, we're also in constant correspondence with the artists. Um, we have a program through the School of Art and Design at U of M where art students come into the gallery and take a tour and then pick pieces of art to write critique letters. Um, so a lot of the artists are actually engaging in I don't want to say an academic critique process, but that sharing of ideas from people that are studying the visual arts. Um, so that's another way that the artists are in communication with the outside world. Do those artists share their work with uh, people inside? The students? Yeah. In addition um, to the letter, do they send a drawing or a Sometimes. Well, I guess they could do anything. Yeah, anything. sometimes they do, and a lot of times the artists send pieces of artwork back. Um, as an expression of gratitude for taking the time to write them and share their thoughts about their work to push them as an artist further. 
uh, into their own process. Interesting shared practice. Yeah. We also have artists who've come, come home, home from prison and they get up and speak and it's, it's always very emotional because they've been imagining this space and now they're in it and, and, and they talk. And, and we also send a, a videotape uh, of the opening reception and of all, all of the works, the 397 uh, works that are in the show this year will go out and it'll be sent to each one of the, the prisons. So there's a lot of uh, communication back and forth. So on the video piece, sorry, I'm going to stop talking. No. I'm fascinated. Uh, um, just the, to the performance, to the theater and dance pieces, do those also, could those be filmed? Can you film the prisoners and the, the, the non-prisoner actors working together and then show that elsewhere or show it to other people inside who aren't part of the creative process? Is it possible to video it's, that it, or no? It, it's a, uh, Deputy Director Dan Golden uh, in 1999 uh, cut off the possibility of of, of videotaping our shows, though we've been videotaping them before. We've managed to get that back, so we've videotaped for the last three or four years. Uh, I don't think we're able to send those videos in of the, of the performances and of the readings and so on. Um, we can explore that, and we've, we've um, we're going to have to get permission again from the new deputy director, uh, Tom Finko. Uh, to uh, to be able to videotape again. You know, I want to add uh, real quick. Like the work that they're describing, what they're doing is incredible. But the reality of it is, um, I don't know exactly how many prisoners uh, that you are, are able to go into, but it's close to 50 prisons and here in the state of Michigan. Or what you want to go with? Five. It's, it's it's now down to I think. Uh, 32 or 33? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's but really been. Well, how many prisoners you are able to go to? And we've actually worked, uh, done workshops in 25 of the Michigan okay. prisons. So the, the reality of the, the other ones that don't get this, and then also it's, even even that is still, um, it's limited. It's limited based upon right. the, the, the connection of what you're able to do with that. I mean, you, you're talking about oppressive state, oppressive situation that's treating, these, treating us, because I'm still there. As chattel, chattel slavery. I um, mean, again, I just told you just the 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 ability to have a book. You know, certain books you you go into the hole. I mean, certain I mean, certain days of certain officers who you know you know bugs coming in, you get excited. They see that excitement, they, they want to fuck your day up. You know, they create you know, write your ticket. Now you can't even go. I mean, so as you hear you you, and you, you you your mind is painting this picture of what's going on, but there's another picture that your mind has realized like. We have to fight for, for the rights of these human beings. You know, again, across the country, you're talking about people where hunger strikes are going on for particular reasons. You know, in California and Ohio and in Atlanta. Basic. You know, you know, where guys are being denied when you're talking about arts and the, the right to, to be a human being. You know, true, a lot of these a lot of these individuals have committed crimes, have done things, but the reality is what about the crime that has been committed against them? and being invested in allowing them to grow as human beings. Because the thing that we have to realize, there's no rehabilitation that's going on in, in these uh, correction facilities. There, there's profit, that's what's going on. And, then we, and we have to talk about that, we have to address that. So again, when you talk about mass incarceration, you talk about Jim Crow, this is, what, this is what's feeding that. You know, here in Detroit, I mean, the state of Michigan, Georgia prisons coming out of the state of Detroit, I mean, city of Detroit, which is a city that's 85% black. You're talking about in rural areas that's 85, 95% white. And most of these prisons was, was, was um, swamplands. Now you're talking about e an economic base for that community that's created jobs. And, so, and prisoners, yeah. are vote, their votes are counted in the camps. The, yeah. yeah. So the benefits. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, representation. No representation. Yeah. The prisoners aren't counted back in their home community. They're counted in the communities where the prisons are. Well, they can't so, vote, but right. they still get they counted can't as far vote. as the number of folks. That so they elected. get counted on the census, yeah. and then that community benefits from an increased population. Yeah, yeah that's been happening for a long time. Um, okay, so I mean this also, I, I love the way that you answered it, and I wish you'd been on stage. I hate always being the only woman up here. Like, um, I wish you'd been <laughs> up here the entire time on the panel, um, because you talked about it. Um, and I want you to answer, you know, how 
how you know on an intuitive level or even you know anecdotally how it's working but do you have ways that you check in besides like giving the people that you're working with surveys like you know how, how do you know that your work is working? Well I, I think I don't, I don't know that we have a, a way of determining that right now. Right. We get some good feedback uh, especially things like Shakespeare Behind Bars, there's a lot of processing that goes on, you know, I'm sure just like the work that they do with the young people. And so I actually get, you know, a good amount of, of reflection from them on the process as they go through this, this theater process. There's also this relationship to, to their real world and experience and how they're internalizing something. So it's, it's, you mean the teachers or the people, the prisoners? The, the, the oh. youth, the youth right. in, in, our, in our facility. Um, and I, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's a. I don't know that this system is ready to support a, a more stronger affirmation. And I say that out of safety for the program, right? Because if we start talking about this, you get those people who say, "Well, my kid don't even get art, you know." And why are we gonna give all the kids that we locked up that don't do nothing good at school? Why don't we give them art and give them theater and give them? And so part of it is being strategic. And I'm not gonna ring too many bells and blow too many whistles right. because then I get those folks who show up saying, "Well, clearly you got too much money if you if you're trying to better." You know, I think you said got a good point. You know, this whole idea of rehabilitation, fortunately in juvenile. You know, this is our work, right? Because it's not supposed to be punitive, which again is a hard conversation to have because everybody expects us to be, you know, teaching people a lesson and punishing them. But we do have some 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 leeway in there. But it's not even about rehabilitation, right? This is about habilitation. We're not trying to get them back to a habit. We're trying to create a new habit. Right. And a big part of that, the system will only allow so much of that. You know, and you know, there are folks. I just had this conversation this week. You know, uh, with the heads of our public education system. You know, there are folks who get elected on tough on crime, right? Yeah. They get elected on I'm going to lock more people up. And the data between educational attainment and art engagement, the data is really clear that these are these are transformative and life changing pieces. But they don't want that information out there because if you start telling everybody we spend more money on art, putting art back in schools, and giving kids more opportunity and reason to be there, then they won't be getting locked up at the tune of $150, $300 a day going into somebody else's car. That's a conversation that creates a lot of problems. And so for me, you know, I know it works because I see it on the ground. And I think that part of it, this is a, this is a guerrilla movement. Yeah. You know, and and I think that in a lot of ways it has to stay at, at that level, because if we draw too much attention to it, I think the people that are traditionally understand that their power sits in our ignorance of, of, of what works will will react immediately and pretty pretty definitively to make sure we stop doing this shit. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that's that's the real danger, and so. Outside of what I know, you know, and we do a lot of treatment planning, we do a lot of personal evaluation. So we evaluate individuals, right. and we can see based on their experience and based on what they have been doing in our treatment programs that young people who are engaged in theater and mural projects, young people who are engaged in, in communicating, who are given that opportunity to get up and speak and learn how to, to, to tell their story, are better. They don't recidivate. They don't come back to us, but you know, when they, they figure out how to navigate a system and to have these other things that connect them to the world outside of that, that small criminal culture, yeah. then they, they don't come back to us. And so for us, I'm, I'm okay with that right now. Okay. I mean, I'd love to be able to publish a study on it, <laughs> but I'd say the day after that study came out, we would all have some problems, right? And so <laughs> it's just one of those things where we, we, you have to be committed to doing the work and understand that it's uh -huh. valuable work whether anybody sees it or not. And I think that's the hard part. Um, you know, art in, in, in these dark places, we just have to keep doing what we know we, we do. That's know? so profound, because theater is all about ultimately exhibition, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. but you got to be careful who's in the audience. I mean, something Yusuf said it connected to Amani's character. I mean, you know, you told us that you hadn't, you know, why you decided to to give those short answers, um, but even if it was from a lack of research in a way, what Yusuf said about if Buzz were to come to the prison and he were to act too excited, 
then he would get a ticket. It, there's a way that there's a constant repression yeah. of emotions. Yeah. So like to ask someone a question and get the yes and no answers, which I've found often working with prisoners too, it, it becomes, that's the culture. It's the stunted answer. Because to express too much emotion, and or uh, particularly, well, emotions being information, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Then there are consequences possible to that. I mean, also, I don't know, I'll say universal, where we begin to expect Anticipate the, uh, the uh, respect the worst and hope for the best. It's, it's such a gloomy situation, such a gloom coming from a gloomy uh, household, gloomy community. Where in the inside, where why do I deserve this? Why why should I even you know begin to to want to do these things? So you so when you get these real things that come in, come in this space now, it touches your humanity. But then you figure, figure a way how to sabotage as well. I remember, you know, I was at this prison in Muskegon, and it was a young guy, and I took a liking to him. I wanted to give him a book. And, no, I wanted to give him a coat because my mother gets bought. She buys me a coat every year. And he was like, man, are you trying? What you trying to sleep with me or something? Right. I'm like, no, nah, brother, I just want to give you a coat, man, because we all we off the river up there. It get cold as hell. Up. And he finally trusted me enough, gave him a coat. We started working out. He started reading books all my life, and we built a we built a, a relationship. But again, you know, we from so, from so many broken promises. A broken dreams. Why? Why should I trust these things? So again, you know, you have a diverse group of folks up here, and I think each one of us plays a key a key role at this component of how to educate. You know, for me on 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 the grassroots level, we keep pushing it because again, you know, when I walk in the door, most of them they don't even know I did nine years, but I, I'm not ashamed of it. So they they know, they know my they know my track record, but then in the reality, they, they begin to see the, the the hope and see the reality. Like, all these guys can, or most of you guys can have the ability to change. But no one has, has spoken up on it since of a Malcolm X, you know, in, in the sense of, of a bold, courageous out there. Because the way, because you know, we, we're I, I use I use the term of um, X Men, where you have you got the, the X Men, but there's more mutants out there than the X Men, and they're so ashamed, they've been so fucked over, that they that they're afraid to come out because they've been socially rejected. So, but we're looking at Charles Xavier and, and uh, the, the little few. And we giving them crumbs while the rest of us is like rats and shit, and, and, we, and we don't know how to behave. But again, that's what arts, you know. Like for me, the biggest thing I could attribute back to my community was, was through a book. You know, reading the Stoddard Shakur book changed my life. Yeah, reading right. George George Jackson book changed my and life. I would say George Jackson even more than Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and George Jackson, some of the things that he was punished for. He of course went to prison for stealing twenty eight dollars worth of something at a gas station, and once he got in prison, kept catching charges based on the officials there. Um, but one of the things that he struggled for in terms of prisoner rights was toilet paper. It was a huge struggle. Libraries, one of the reasons there are were libraries up until about four or five years ago in prisons was because of George Jackson. And then even as Hassan's talking about an underground theater, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, say, Belarus's, you know, free theater program, you know. Um, people know about the Belarus theater. I have a friend, Madeline Slacker, who's working with the Euro Belarus is Europe's last dictatorship, and they have this underground theater company called Free Theater, and, you know, they, they perform and do their work at great risk, and you talking about, you know, not wanting this, even though we have people who are here to write a book, um, you talking about not wanting this to necessarily get publicity brings to mind Europe's friggin' last <laughs> dictatorship. It brings to mind the Belarus Free Theater Company. I have a question for you, Seth. Um, you've spoken about your experiences while inside. I was wondering if you had access to any um, artistic programs that were um, helpful in your journey. God, I get it. That's why I was brought up. Like, I never, this this program you, that, that they did was never afforded at the, the prison I was at. Muskegon, Coldwater, Algin Max. Um, only the real, the closest thing was a, was a book program where out of state they was donating donating books. But it, but also again in the process once once you begin to understand what life is about and in, in the truest sense now you begin to form that within prison and you begin to. You know, me and Dream, you know, we're exchanging books. You know, we, 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 we've carved our own reality within this harsh reality. Uh, but as far as actual pro programs, 
there, there, was, there was none. Then, particularly in the '90s, when I when I went to prison, you know, John 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 Engler, who was the governor at the mm -hmm. time, he 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 had removed the majority of those programs. Out, the only thing you could do was get a GED. Mm -hmm. That's funny. So that what Alana has a, a line in her song "Emergence," where she, you know, you heard her last night. She talks about parallel universes. And obviously prison in some ways is a parallel universe and then you talk about within that place creating a separate parallel universe. It's like places on top of places on top of places. So we have just a few minutes left yep. so you know to sort of... I figured yeah. there's your yeah. moments. <laughs> We're done. I mean, I, I really... I'd like to talk about a, a couple sure. of things really quickly. Uh, we actually have a speaker's bureau. Okay. Um, and we train people to answer really, really tough questions. And then we go out and we take those very tough questions. So that's one of the things we do. Another thing we do is, is that when people leave our organization and, and gra graduate or, or leave, uh, they, um, they're now 244 of them around the country doing social justice work. Um, and they continue to do this kind of work because of the kind of training, because of the kind of instruction they've got, and, and, and so on. And the third thing, very quickly, is that we were able to work with four uh, prisoners who'd come home to create a play called When Can We Talk? Uh, and we got them equity rates, so they were able to be paid for the work they, they were doing. Well, I hope this um, panel has been useful or inspiring in some way. I know I'm clearly inspired um, yeah. <laughs> as you go back and, and do your work. And I hope that we'll have some continued sharing. Question. Yeah, sure. One of the things that I noticed is that in terms of budgeting, like the budget for, say, rehabilitation or reintegration is like very small, but then the budget for researching re rehabilitation or reintegration is huge. So is there any way that <laughs> Like, maybe we could work as artists to turn our work into more of something that can be taken as a research base form. I think it's a great idea. I think that if you look at what's coming out from the Department of Justice now, reentry is the single biggest justice movement that we have. And it's not because they're altruistic folks who finally got it and said, what are we doing locking all these people up? They're going, oh shit, we spend all this money on those people, right? Because, I mean, it's the truth. And finally, it this is the other side of it. It's finally tipping the other way. Everybody who's going to benefit from the prison industrial complex got their checks already, and now the rest of us are just paying out, out for it. And so there really is a strong movement. Everything that I've seen in the last couple of years coming out as far as grant money is about reentry. And so, and I think that lo looking at the arts as a reclamation tool, and that's a word that I use and I try to, art is a reclamation tool. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to reclaim and reintegrate folks. And if we start to get our head around using that language and start to, to really focus our work on, and, and I don't, you know, it'll be impossible for any of us as artists to go in and say, I want to do a program for justice on art. But if you start partnering with the counseling agencies, you start partnering with mental health, and mental health is a great place to be because trauma is at the core of this. Art therapy, we know it works. You start to integrate. So we start integrating all the different pieces of what we do into the same conversation as these folks who have the, the right papers. And, and these, are, these are great partnerships because the idea is to, just like you see so many prisons being closed down here, they're trying to get more of these folks out. And what they recognize is they have done a piss poor job of preparing folks to get out, right, Yusuf? Of getting them ready to actually come out and be productive citizens. And so how do you write that? You write that by finding a way to engage them intensely, you know, in, in, in building and creating something that can really drive them and maybe even be some benefit to the community. And arts is a great entrepreneurial environment. I mean, we have people we can create and survive in, in, in environments and economies that other folks can't. Right. And so I think that if we use that as a transferable skill, if we use that as a component of what we're doing with education, with mental health, with social services, and we, we really do insert ourselves in this <coughs> conversation as professional artists with something to offer. We're not just a guy on the corner who's painted bronze, right? You know, I mean, I, I think that we, we have a lot of stereotypes to overcome as artists. Yeah. You know, and, you know, for me, it's, I mean, being... 
walking in two worlds like this has been really interesting for me because, you know, it, it really has shown me that there's this huge disconnect. But if, if we can start to adjust our focus, I mean, the work that we do is work that speaks for itself. But every time we start talking about art to the people who have the strings right now, we sign with that teacher on Charlie Brown. <laughs> wah, 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 you know, they just, they just nod until you finally get tired and walk away. But this is a credible conversation. And when you stop, when you stop talking about it makes you feel good, when you stop talking about the, you know, the, the ability to express yourself and to speak, you know, and you start talking about dollars and cents. Yeah. You start talking about education and the arts together. Those two components, education and the arts together, are critical because they, they reduce criminality, they reduce crime-related costs across the board. People who are engaged start to actually invest in the economy, income. We're talking people taking their kids to Chuck E. Cheese. And so for me, all my conversations with the Rotary, with the Chambers, with legislators when I go down and have to testify, I'm not talking about all the stuff that I grew up talking about, how it saved my life because it yeah. gave me purpose and made me feel valuable because they just glaze over. And so I just throw up the slide that says 30% reduction in violent crime. You know, 16% reduction in arson, 10%, you know, and they go, oh, wait a minute, is this the same conversation? I go, yeah, and by the way, you know, it's cheaper too, right? Right, because, and so I mean, it really is about us developing a, a more comprehensive conversation about yeah. what we do. Art is not an add-on. Art is not a supplement. No. And for so long, that is all we have been. Art is integral. Right? It is a necessary component to human beings and creativity and live spirits, and we have never been able to express that in a way that allows other folks to understand it. And so we have to, we have to adjust our conversation some yeah. so that we get all the data points in there, yeah. and then we can get to the work. And I think there's lots of money out there to get this work done, and we have to do what we do best, get creative about getting to it. Hassan, thank you. You should write a manual. Uh, you really should. Um, and thank you for your pragmatism and your passion for balancing your principles with this pragmatism. You clearly read and want to spook who sat by the door. <laughs> and you get in the door and you're really creating real change. Buzz, thank you for the experience that you brought to this. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm overwhelmed by the the volume of work that you've done and that you've dedicated your life to. And, and Yusuf, thank you for you know, sharing your life and your story um, so selflessly with so many and for doing what the work that you've done to restore Detroit and to restore the neighborhoods in Detroit. And thank you all for listening and participating and let's enjoy some lunch. So, and thank you, Dream, for leading us in this conversation. Okay?